Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Wirth. I'm the Curatorial Assistant to the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs here at the Blanchon. And today I'm joined by Jenna Labraska, a doctoral candidate in art history at UT Austin, specializing in modern contemporary art. Uh, she was also the Blanton's Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Prints and Drawings for the 2020-2021 academic year. Uh, say, hello. say hello, Jenna. Hello. Thanks so much for logging in. <laughs> uh, welcome to our curated conversation. Uh, we moved the series from Tuesday evenings to Wednesdays uh, at noon so people can look at art while they have lunch. Uh, and today's topic is Conversing with Prints, the making of Without Limits. Uh, Jen and I will walk you through the development of our Paper Vault exhibition, Without Limits, Helen Frankenthaler, Abstraction, and the Language of Print. Uh, before we start, uh, a few notes. Uh, your audio is muted, uh, so no one can hear you and only panelists are visible on screen. Uh, Auto-generated closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking your questions uh, from the Q&A window. Uh, just click the icon below the type and, and send your questions. Uh, feel free to make comments in the chat window, but please ask your questions uh, through the Q&A box. Today's event is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, and YouTube roughly one week from today. <clears throat> so uh, let's get started. Without Limits uh, celebrates a generous gift of 10 prints and six fruits from the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. Uh, the prints in the gift bookend a 50 year stretch of the artist's career uh, with the earliest print, uh, screen print um, dated 1967 and the latest print uh, being a woodcut from 2005. The gift also consists of prints made using a wide variety of techniques, uh, including lithographs, etchings, screen prints, woodcuts and monotypes which is a testament to Frankenthaler's long-term, prolific, and tirelessly innovative work in the medium of printmaking. The Frankenthaler Foundation has made several gifts of prints to the university, university museums around the country, but ours, as far as we know, is the only exhibition connected, connected with this, this initiative to pair Frankenthaler's work with that of other artists. Uh, this gave us an exciting opportunity to showcase rarely seen works uh, from the Blanton's collection. The dynamic variety of prints of the gifts afforded us a broad historical time frame through which to us to consider artists we might not typically think of as Frankenthaler's contemporaries, in which specific prints might be interesting visual companions uh, to her work. Um, from the beginning, we really wanted to seek out uh, artists that are better known as painters, but who like Frankenthaler took printmaking seriously as a ground for formal and technical experimentation. So who was Helen Frankenthaler and who was she as a printmaker? Um, she was born in 1928 in New York City. She grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and went to private schools. Uh, she had a very you know, privileged upbringing. Um, she went to the Dalton Academy. One of her teachers there was the Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo. Um, in 1949, she graduated from Bennington College and then moved back to New York. And she there briefly studied painting with Hans Hoffman. Um, Frankenthaler first saw the work of the abstract expressionist painter Jackson Pollock, who you might have heard of, um, when she was in her early 20s at a show at the Betty Parsons Gallery, which, and then later her friend, um, the art critic Clement Greenberg, brought her to Pollock's studio, where she, you know, as the lore goes, she was sort of inspired um, by that visit to paint um, like Pollock did on these very large canvases that were placed directly on the floor. Um, and so she would work on these can these really large canvases with her full body from above, as you see her doing here on the right. 
Um, and um, there's this great episode of a Getty podcast called Recording Artists that has um, some excerpts of um, interviews that I'd like to kind of briefly quote here. So she, um, this is a quote with the art historian Barbara Rose and where she talks about the impact of visiting Pollock's studio on her. And she says, I think the thing that his, hit me most of all was that it became a physical necessity to get pictures off the easel. The reach or fluidity of working from above down into a field really registered when I saw his studio and he unrolled the paintings on the floor that he had painted them on. Um, but, but as we'll see, she took a really different approach from Pollock, um, telling Rose that she didn't like the idea of the drip, which um, Pollock was so known for, um, instead favoring the seep, soak, and stain of these very thinned um, oil paints and later acrylics um, that she would apply in these sort of veils or layers of color. Um, she told Rose that she didn't like the drip because it's kind of a boring accident to me. There are many accidents that are very rich and that you use, but if you exploit a drip, it's very boring and familiar. Drips are drips. Um, so Rose is still asking, so what did you get from this encounter with Pollock's work? And Frankenthaler says, I think a certain attitude that was probably in me already, but I hadn't used it yet. And that was sort of let her rip go free, you have the wherewithal, just go, run with it, try it, fool it or fool around. Um, so this attitude, I think, really inspired both of us and um, helped us, helped inform us in choosing the work. And then I also just wanted to shout out the artist, a Amy Silman, who's written um, wonderfully about Frankenthaler, who is another artist that I think we both wish that we could have included in the show, but we don't have any prints by her in our collection. Um, and she wrote of Frankenthaler, uh, Lavender Mist was Pollock's title, but he could not get it to happen. She did it. Her work is diaphanous. Um, so yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, Frankenthaler's breakout painting was Mountains of sea, Mountains and Sea of 1952. And she, um, Frankenthaler is credited as the inventor of the soak stain technique, which ended up becoming really important for color field painting. And this involves spilling and pouring diluted paints using gravity over a raw and unprimed canvas. Um, so that it kind of bleeds into the warp and weft of the fabric. And so this technique in effect merges the pigment with the canvas um, and Frankenthaler kind of uses it, ex explores this throughout her career and finds this path between spontaneity and control. Um, and she's exploiting what is ultimately unpre uh, unpredictable um, in the interactions among materials, shape and color. And so the Bland actually owns two paintings by Frankenthaler. Um, you may have seen them on view in the past. They may feel familiar to you. Um, and again, I just wanted to sort of have some of Frankenthaler's work kind of wash over us visually here as we begin this conversation, since we have the advantage of having the whole internet and all the images on it. <laughs> um, additionally, at the beginning of our research for this show, um, I did a lot of scanning since these were these kind of big, heavy, books on ab abstract expressionism. And um, so it was just kind of scrolling back through these paintings and was just really feeling so in awe of Frankenthaler. These are also the middle and the right image are works that you might see um, in US public collections. The um, flood is from the Whitney and Jacob's Ladder, I think might currently be on view at MoMA. I saw it this summer and it was quite beautiful. Um, and then, you know, in the seventies, her work, um, just continues to kind of grow and change, but also remains within this very kind of abstract vocabulary. So again, just more, more uh, images that I scanned <laughs> that I wanted to share. Um, yeah, Any, do you have anything to add there, Christian? Uh, no, these are kind of beautiful examples of her work. Um, and now we're sort of going to transition from her painting to her print. Um, so first I really wanted us to, we really wanted to start to talk about the process of the show. You know, it was very difficult to organize the show in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I hadn't met Jana in person at all when we started on this project, only through Zoom. Uh, so we really started in the fall of 2020 with these sort of initial conversations and, so first through Zoom meetings, uh, we talked about the show, our, our ideas, uh, looked at a few things in our database um, that might work. Um, and then we 
set up a series of visits uh, to the HEB study room uh, at the museum. Um, our colleagues in print and drawings, Holly Borum and Geneva Higginson, graciously arranged uh, the study uh, for us to sort of come and visit uh, very socially distant. So what would happen is we would set up these appointments, either Jana or I would go first, and then, then the other person would go look at the work, and then we'd meet outside and sort of go over our notes and sort of think about you know, um, our ideas of like what we wanted to include. Um, it really gave us an opportunity to carefully look the work at the works up close um, without frames and looking at things like blind stamps, um, which usually identify the print workshop in which the print was made. Um, also really interesting to note uh, the photograph we included of the HEB study room it definitely didn't look like that when we were there, um, essentially because the museum was totally empty and closed. Yeah. It was really special. Like, I think at that point in deep pandemic, it was like ha rarely having the opportunity to see works of art in person. And these were sort of these private opportunities to look at works. So we looked at a lot of stuff and we looked at a lot of stuff that we didn't end up putting in the show. Um, like some of these, I kind of went back through my pictures from our study room visits. And I think in seeing these different categories of abstract prints, um, we started to really kind of refine and luckily we're largely in agreement um, about what we wanted to draw out and the works we were pairing with the Franken dollars. So I think from the beginning, both of us really felt like we wanted to sort of bracket out all geometric abstraction. We wanted to stay sort of in a more gestural vein. Um, and then, yeah, and I think something that was clear to both of us in our research was that, you know, Frankenthaler is really exploiting all the kind of potential of this as we've kind of been talking about this interplay between spontaneity or spontaneity and gesture and control um, and material. Um, and, and that also both for both of us process was important. So we looked, we looked at groups of prints based on what kinds of tex techniques were being used because we knew early on that we were gonna organize the show that way. Yeah, I would also note that, um, you know, we went from 120 works to oh. down to, to about 36 work and a lot of the culling and the and the cutting of the of the list really was about not having too much of a very specific kind of print so as you can tell these four um are all lithographs and we just couldn't make the whole show lithographs so we really had to be careful and sort of strike a balance between the different uh printmaking techniques and the artists we were including but I still look at this like Asker Yarn print and I'm like, I miss that, like, I love that print, but it just didn't. Another thing was scale too. I mean, as Justin pointed out in the chat, you know, Helen Frankenthaler worked really large um, in general in her paintings. She worked smaller in print, but she still worked fairly large. Um, in the case of this giant Richard Serra that's on the cart there in the study room, this one was like too big and too black. So, but we did get to look at it, which was, which was fun. Um, I still miss this Miro. I, these were these like this slide. I feel like are ones that I, I kind of wanted, but maybe Christian didn't want the Bonta then in particular. <laughs> no, I, these were great, and you know, a lot of these, like the Nevelson and the Bonta they were just too small. They you were, know? So and dumb. and we really wanted big and colorful, um, just to really make an impact. Um, but yeah, it was still fun going over all the prints over several days and then just getting to look at art when everything we were looking at was on the screen for the longest time. Yeah, and works on paper just, I mean, the, that's the point of the print study room, right? Is that, you know, looking at these works in person is absolutely essential to understanding them and to, and to knowing where to go in your research as we started the process of, um, of writing about them. Yeah, <clears throat> and that sort of leads us to the next topic was uh, something that also really interested us was the social elements of printmaking, uh, especially for artists who uh, usually work alone. So obviously in the images that we showed earlier, it's just Helen Frankenthaler, canvas on the floor, just her doing her thing. 
Um, but you really notice the difference in the process photos between these pictures of Frank Thaler in her painting studio and the ones of her in a printmaking studio. Uh, the image on the right, she's working on <clears throat> a print called Earth Slice, which is in the exhibition. Um, and one thing we wanted to point out is that uh, Lydia Pine, who reviews our show for Glass Tire, um, she said in her piece that print is really a, uh, quote, social medium. And we emphasize that in our extended labels, uh, where we've named many of the printmakers and workshops uh, that Frankenthaler and the other artists sort of collaborated with uh, to realize their abstract works. Um, the works in the show really demonstrate Frankenthaler's contribution uh, to a printmaking renaissance in the mid 20th century collab by collaborating with printmakers at studios like uh, Universal uh, Limited Art Editions in Long Island, uh, Mistografia in Los Angeles, and Tyler Graphics. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so the next phase for us really became the sort of research and writing. Um, when the exhibition, when this project sort of came to us, it had a different title. Um, it was just, it was Helen Frankenthaler and the Language of Abstraction. And I think through the process of looking at the works and starting to learn about her practice, um, what we realized we were really dealing with was in curating the show was not so much a language of abstraction, but really a language of printmaking and also a language of collaboration. So, you know, she starts making prints, she starts making lithographs in 1961. Um, by that time, she's a pretty seasoned painter. And then, you know, she would go on to make prints throughout the rest of her long career. Um, but she's, she's adapting, uh, like a lot of these artists kind of talk about um, in, in their interactions with, with printmakers and print workshops. Um, but yeah, that's involving collaboration and this kind of new language of techniques and materials. And so in reading interviews with the artist, um, we noticed that Frankenthaler was just filled with these kind of great one-liners. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to kind of watch, search her on YouTube and, and, and watch her talk because she's just great. Um, but the title Without Limits comes from a quote, a quote where Frankenthaler talks about her approach to printmaking. So she says, my approach had to be, I'm on my own, to be thoroughly me without limits and anything is possible given the medium. Um, and so, for the title of, so we kept kind of harvesting from Frankenthaler's words. Um, and so we used, for the title of this program, um, we also used this, you know, idea of conversing with prints because of a quote we ended up using in our label for um, the work Harvest and all the trial proofs, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, she said, I don't always know what I want to achieve in a print until I see it growing along. As a print evolves, it tells you, you tell it, you have a conversation with a print. Um, you also have a conversation with the people executing them. You also have conversations over Zoom and in person with your collaborators. <laughs> and we're having a conversation with you right now. <laughs> yes. Um, so no, now sort of like the fun part of organizing a show. Um, so when it really came time to sort of hang the show, we were able to play around with the list of works that we had chosen. Uh, and sort of put them in this uh, model uh, to sort of see what works work well grouped together and how they relate to each other. Um, this was this happened, I'd say, uh, in the summer of 2021. So, you know, Jen and I are both vaccinated and we, you know, are excited and finally get to work together in the space and, uh, and then play around with this model, um, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, so you can see that each of the works is printed out to scale on a chip. Um, and I see in the chat that there's a question um, from my friend Jennifer Elsner um, about the space. And so this is where that kind of really came into play. You can see in the image on the left, all the little chips that kind of, by that time they were still on the checklist, we were still considering them. But by the time the chips were in the space um, and we could see them interacting together, they kind of, that, that's when they, they got bumped. Cause I think the checklist still had like, 40 or 50 works on it at that point. Uh, yeah, it's always, it's also, you know, there's that phrase, kill your darlings. You really, this is the point in the process where you have to just make your decision to cut something, to never think about it again, just forget that you even chose it. Um, 
you know, I, you can kind of tell right here, uh, this is a, a work by Robert Motherwell, and we had already decided of, on another work by Motherwell, and we weren't going to have two Motherwells in this show. Um, so it's sort of those kinds of decisions that you have to make uh, at this point in the process. Um, one other thing I wanted to show everyone is part of working remotely. So we were able to come go into the space, lay everything out, make sort of the slight tweaks that you would want uh, to make in person. Um, and I wanted to point out the image on the left. Uh, so after Jenna and I were both, well, actually I was in the studio, I was in the gallery space and Jenna was in New York. So I was FaceTiming her uh, just going through every wall. And so she had, so she had any ideas or opinions that they would be incorporated into the show and through the process of hanging. Um, after I get home that day and I'm looking through the pictures, I noticed that the order of prints uh, for the trial proofs for harvest on the left side are out of order. So freaking out a little bit, I just, I go on my phone, I make this little uh, drawing and then send it to our exhibition designer so that he, while he's still in the gallery, he can quickly make the switch before they actually go up on the wall. Um, you know, but the, that's just one of the things where you're kind of working from home, but then you're also you know, coming into the gallery for certain things and sort of how you navigate that. Um, you know, so now the show is up and we, the show is up now until February 20th. And we're gonna just quickly, you know, for the rest of the program, kind of walk through the show, pick out some of our favorites. And if anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so the way the show was organized, as you sort of saw in, um, in the model, the galleries are three galleries of equal size. And since we had so many different printmaking techniques, we decided to sort of divide them up by printmaking technique. So you have this gallery here at the beginning, all lithographs. Um, and then here in the center gallery, one side had uh, etchings, and then the other side had groupings of wood woodcuts and screen prints. And then in the last gallery here, we had one side embossed prints and then the other side uh, unique prints, which were mono prints and monotypes. So we'll start with um, the lithographs. So I'm gonna very, I'm gonna give very broad definitions of what these printmaking techniques are. I highly encourage if uh, to go on YouTube type in lithograph and then you'll see, uh, you know, actual artists and printmakers show you how these are made. Um, that's how I, it helped me sort of learn the different techniques. You know, there's one thing about reading them and then there's another about seeing someone doing them. Um, so I think one of the benefits from the past year uh, where a lot of studio classes were done virtually is that a lot of, uh, teachers and professors were able to film what they, these different techniques for their classroom. So lithograph, uh, essentially a lithograph is made uh, by an artist drawing on a slab of limestone using an oil uh, crayon or paint. Um, and then through a chemical process, it leaves sort of an image on the stone that then you can put um, ink on rolling on and then put it through a press and then you come out with the print. Um, in this set, uh, one of the approves, this is all for, this is, these are set of proofs for the print harvest uh, from 1976. And it's really special that we were given, you know, not just prints, but also the, these set of proofs that sort of allow us to, and allow the viewer to sort of look at the, um, at the process, at the evolution of a, of a print. Um, here, Frankenthaler plays with color, with line, borders, paper types before she reaches her final composition, uh, which is the one on the right. Um, and these works are examples of trial and working proofs. Um, so essentially they test, the, they test the prints 
during the process. And then the artist sort of comes in, makes notes about any changes they want until um, you sort of come up with the final print. And then this work on the very end of this wall uh, is what's called a cancellation proof. So essentially, once the print edition is made, a you kind of not damage, but you sort of mark the stone uh, in a way that you're you no longer can make any unauthorized prints with that composition. Um, so in that cancellation proof is proof that um, you know the edition is complete. Um, and I would really encourage <clears throat> just to jump in here. Like one of the great things. I mean, as Christian um, is probably about to say, you know, we this gift includes this group of proofs um, that you know you don't often get to see these things in a museum, and um, it really kind of unfolds this process that Frankenthaler was doing. And kind of there's tape, there's different reds there, so it you know that that argument that it, about abstract art that like my kid could do this, like there's a lot more kind of you, you, this really kind of enables you to see all of the different choices um, and very intentional moves Frank and Dollar is making at every step of the process. Right, and she um, she always there's another quote by her where she talks about the printmaking process, and she always wanted sort of to start out by asking questions and sort of experimenting. So she would say well, suppose I do this, or suppose I try that. Um, um, she approached sort of printmaking in that way where she wanted to sort of have a balance of control and chance, the same way as her paintings, where she sort of controlled the movement of paint on the canvas, then allowed it to, um, allowed chance to sort of also contribute. Um, and so just a few more, Here's sort of a, um, the image of the final product. This is what's called an artist proof. So aside from the addition, an artist proof is essentially, the artist keeps this for her, his or her own record. Um, and then here's another example of a lithograph by Helen Frankenthaler. Yeah, this is this is one of our darlings. This is um, bronze smoke. It's on a wall all by itself um, in the first gallery of the exhibition. Um, so here's, you know, there's there's this kind of like wonderful tawny brown paper. And one of the things that we were able to do um, in getting access to the Frankenthaler print catalog resume, um, they it, the the publication does a great job of really unpacking. Okay, this, you know, the the bottom layer. Um, which is this sort of flat bronze color. And then the, this keystone the, or what is called the keystone, which is the, um, the, the litho like lithographic stone with the design on it is kind of placed on top in a second run. Um, and so she's kind of achieving this very diaphanous smoky image um, by brushing and pooling this oil-based ink on the surface of the stone. Um, and yeah, so we have we have um, some great representation of Frankenthaler's sort of 70s print making um, also in the following gallery with Ganymede and Earth Slice, which I think we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, and here are just examples of, here are the prints that are on the other side of that gallery that are also lithographs. On the very left, you have a work by Suzanne Rothenberg, which is one of the biggest prints in the show and probably one of the biggest prints we have in our collection. Um, and then just a few, uh, the, then next to that one is, an, is a print by Paul Jenkins, uh, then Sam Francis, Carol Dunham, um, and then James Brooks. And then right here uh, is a really lovely gecko. Um, so we aren't just looking at uh, American artists in this show, we're kind of looking at an, our entire collection of uh, artists who would be considered Helen Frankenthaler's contemporaries, you know, she, which are most artists in the 20th century. Uh, but Gago, of course, is uh, a Venezuelan artist. And, um, and then the others are, are New York based or were New York based. Um, I wanted just to quickly talk about the Rothenberg 
Uh, it's called Stumblebum, and it's one of her largest and most ambitious prints. Um, and it has these sort of varied textures and subtle different differentiation in colors um, that you can really see when you're in, there in person. Um, and it's kind of a rich symphony of surfaces, and it's a very complex and uses multiple printings from several different kinds of matrices. Um, the title character is based on Rothenberg's abstract drawing of the printer she worked with at ULAE. Uh, his name is Keith Barinholt. And so this really is a great testament to um, artists collaborating with these sort of master printmakers to create these work. And this is sort of a dedication to that uh, process. Um, so this is our, this is the etching area of the show or part of it, not, not all of it. Um, etchings are part of the intaglio class of printmaking. So it means that there is a design that's um, etched into a, a, usually a copper plate that has a kind of a waxy acid resistant ground. So it has this relationship with drawing and um, is really especially um, useful for kind of articulating line. Um, so you use this etching needle to make your drawing, it exposes the copper below, then you place the plate in an acid bath that bites the exposed copper. Um, and we have labels, I should say, additional labels in addition to our, um, the ones on the individual works that explain the different printmaking techniques in each of the different galleries. So you can have the experience if you want to of looking at these works while you also learn about the technique and think about how each artist is kind of differently leveraging the potentials offered by that technique to kind of make their composition. Um, so we have two works, two related, as it turns out, works um, in this section by Frankenthaler, both from the same year, Earth Slice and Ganymede. Um, I, I've been kind of privately thinking of these as sort of her, her land art moment, uh, part of her land art moment. I mean, as we saw earlier, the works in the 70s become so kind of stretched out and um, landscape-like. Um, and I think here we can see this on a much smaller scale. So um, these works were made um, with Tyler Graphics, which was, uh, she, um, Frank Thaler worked with Kenneth Tyler for multiple decades um, on different, many different prints. And so in this work, in these two works, she's repurposed three of the four copper plates that she used in Earth Slice for Ganymede, um, which is the name, which the title is the name of um, Jupiter's largest moon. And so she worked with these plates for over a course of multiple years, kind of cropping, rotating, adjusting the colors. And I think if you look closely at both prints um, in the gallery, you can kind of start to pick out which designs are repeated. There's a shift in orientation. Um, and then she can, then she used the plates again um, to make a group of monoprints called experimental exp impressions one through nine. Um, so those plates went on to have another life. And then I just wanted to pause quickly on this work, which has uh, kind of confused me in an amusing way since we first started looking at these uh, round robin from 2000. I think this is um, a great way to see the combination of um, sort of more articulated lines and tonal variation and color that are made available through the through aquatint and mesotint, which are basically kind of raw powdered rosins that are also applied to the plate and react with the chemicals to um, produce these different visual effects. And I find this work kind of humorous, almost kind of goofy looking bird head with these bright colors and playful shapes. Um, another work in the etching section is um, a work we were really excited to include um, and it's by um, the artist Julie Maratu, another, another kind of artist who usually works very large, um, on, makes very large paintings, um, but is also clearly very gifted as a drafts person. Um, this work is called Local Calm. It's one of three prints in a series called Heavy Weather. Um, and Mer Meritu began these works um, in the periods between the very chaotic time between Hurricanes Katrina and Rita during the 2005 Atlantic hurricane season, which was the most um, intense ever recorded until 2020. Um, and we may find that 2020 
21 or 22 might be a more intense hurricane year, unfortunately. Um, so Meritu is evoking kind of roiling wind and pelting rain of a, of a chaotic storm and is also layering them as is her kind of custom in her work with these geometric lines and shapes and planes. Um, these prints were made at Crown Point Press in San Francisco, like some of, there's a couple of other works in the exhibition that also were. Um, and, she, you know, you can see in this image, Maratu kind of working in a very detailed way on these multiple um, printing plates so that she's able to kind of get all these different kinds of mark, mark making gest gestures into the final print. Um, and then this work uh, by Ana Leticia, who is a Brazil Brazilian artist, um, is kind of like Round Robin, is a very strange kind of kooky print that I just, once I saw in person, I kind of fell in love with. Um, it Here, the artist sort of draws on abstract organic forms to produce fossilized images from sort of this imagined primordial past. Um, after she studied engraving and exp uh, with the expressionist artist Iber Camargo, she began teaching printmaking workshops in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and she's kind of, she's very much inspired by nature. Um, and she uses a lot of spirals that kind of derive from shells, uh, snail shells that sort of reveal the interior and exterior worlds, um, both the visible and the invisible. And for this print, um, is a great example of very uh, of different engraving techniques, these sort of etched lines that you can make. So here you have the sort of swath of small rice-like shapes um, above sort of longer sinewy lines um, that sort of end on paper in a pool of black ink. And for me, it kind of results in kind of like a prehistoric jellyfish organ organism that's sort of petrified in stone. Um, you know, we don't have many small works and definitely very few works that were in, that are just in black in this show, but I just thought I really wanted to include this one. Um, Another work that so, really benefits from being viewed in person, I should add. So please go yeah. see. <laughs> um, and then, so across from these etchings, you have a section of woodcuts and woodcuts essentially sound exactly what they are. Um, the, there's a design that's sort of carved into blocks of wood um, and then leaving sort of a background, you sort of carve away the background and you have these sort of raised lines in the design. Um, and then the raised lines are what gets the ink and then they're pressed against paper to sort of re reveal the design. Um, <clears throat> so here we have a few examples of, um, of woodcuts. Um, what's interesting, so I wanted just to focus on this one by Frank and Thaler, uh, from 2005. It's a later work and I, it's one of my favorite works in the show. Uh, it's called Japanese Mabel from 2005. And here, uh, Frank Fowler is really employing uh, a centuries old technique of uh, woodcut called yuki -oh um, that is sort of derived from Japan. Um, and as opposed to sort of Western techniques, which use oil-based ink um, and immense pressure to get the design on paper, the Japanese style woodcut prints are made uh, with water-based ink and sort of a more softer pressure. So you sort of get this, so you sort of get the ink kind of bleed into each other and you have these wonderful sort of watercolor-like compositions. Um, this print in particular um, was made, uh, was named after a tree outside her home in Connecticut. And in order, in order and to create this, uh, Frank Thaler, as you can see on the left, she, uh, she was given sort of, she, she used a piece of plywood that has sort of this, uh, wood grain on it. And then she just painted on top of that plywood and let the ink uh, sort of bleed into uh, this sort of porous piece of wood. Um, and then when she had that, it's essentially a, a study. And from the study, you had uh, two, um, sort of two master printmakers, uh, Yasu Shibata and Bill Hall from Pace Prints in New York, translate her study 
into nine separate wood blocks um, and used 16 different colors. Um, so that when all pressed into one piece of paper, you come up with this, com uh, this composition. What's really interesting also is that they also mimic the wood grain from the plywood. Um, so you have this sort of this sort of trompe l'oeil natural wood grain pattern that appears on the paper um, that is really it's referencing both the title and the technique and the material that's really used uh, to make the print. Um, and then we have this beautiful, this big, beautiful Diebenkorn woodcut, which um, also is um, quite complex in its production. There were, I think, 19 different um, wood blocks or something like this. Oh yeah, 12 blocks and 19 different colors. Um, Diebenkorn had a, um, I'm sorry, where are we in our, Thing. Oh, it was, yeah, also made by Crown Point Press, like, like Meritu's, but it was printed in Kyoto, Japan. Um, they had this program at the time where artists were doing these sort of exchanges. And so um, Deepa Korn actually worked with these, worked with these master carvers and printers in Kyoto, who were very kind of versed in this traditional style of Yukio e printmaking. Um, and I just, there was a quote that I was able to find in my research on this piece that I think also um, was helpful in sort of understanding what it is for painters to be working with printmakers um, and having to translate their, you know, in this case, this was a study with collage and watercolor that was then translated into these wood blocks by people with whom Diebenkorn would have had a language barrier. So it was a complicated process. And Diebenkorn says, as must happen, and I counted on it, distortions do present themselves. It is not my way to throw that away. Then you begin to work with the distortions and finally find yourself quite a distance away from the original thrust. Superficially, the work is the same. Actually, it has become a collaboration, which one then tries to control. In a way, however, it isn't far from what can happen in one's studio when one is alone. Disasters do occur, unexpected drying, etc., in which one works with, works with the distortion and carries it through as best one can. So, I mean, I think another takeaway that we wanted to people to have with this show, and I think, you know, have seen people notice is that um, we really wanted to sort of celebrate this experimental attitude and working within, working within being comfortable with exploiting the kind of potential of ambiguity and accident and um, the unexpected. So I hope that's something that people can sort of feel in looking at these works. Um, so this is the, this is one of my favorite corners of the show. On the left, we have um, this kind of lone Frankenthaler from 67. Um, it's untitled. It was made by um, a short-lived screen printing outfit in New York City that um, was one of the first screen printing shops to work for artists, not just for commercial clients making, you know, posters for shows and stuff. Um, to the right of that on the screen is the Motherwell print we were mentioning earlier. So um, Frankenthaler was married to Motherwell for a number of years. And so we thought it would make sense to include him in the show as a sort of shared generation. And then on the right is um, another kind of favorite of mine is large Elizabeth Murray print. Um, what were we going to talk about with these? So yeah, screen printing is this as a stencil based technique. Um, you're forcing ink through this mesh screen onto a surface. It can, it's usually paper in this case, but it could also be a t-shirt or a tote bag or whatever else you're screen printing on. Um, so unlike a lot of other printmaking techniques, you have this, you have the same orientation in the design as you have in the final work. And also screens are very um, durable. And so you can make many, many prints. Although in this fine art context, you'd have probably a pretty limited edition. Um, so yeah, here's our Frankenstein and our Motherwell. Did you want to say, add anything? Yeah, um, I just wanted to point out uh, a few things about um, both of their sort of printmaking careers. Essentially that um, in 1961, he made, uh, Motherwell made his first set of prints at ULAE after the at the suggestion of Frankenstein when they were married. 
Um, and funny enough, both artists actually preferred other printmaking techniques like etching and lithography um, because of sort of the fluidity that they were able to achieve, um, you know, that related more to their painting practice. Uh, you know, when it comes to, at least for them, they, when they did screen prints, they kind of came out uh, a more matte and sort of flat. Um, and that's not really, and they preferred just a more painterly gestural style. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, and also that the, um, <clears throat> the Elizabeth Murray, you know, this is her first print. This is the first screen print that she made. And she really has fun with it. You know, you can sort of, you know, and this work was done in the 80s. So she's sort of a younger generation. And here you see her adding layers of different ink to sort of create a more, more depth, essentially. Um, so these, this is just a really nice comparison from younger generation artists to the older who really screen printing was not their, per, you know, their thing, essentially. Yeah, you can also see it as sort of like a rebuttal, like she, if Frankenthaler and Motherwell were not so satisfied with what screen printing could offer them, here's Murray, just through so many different runs through the printing press, or through the the press and through using all these different colors is really able to achieve this level of kind of depth and dynamism um, by using that technique. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so then the final gallery, um, one section is um, a selection of our embossed prints uh, in our collection. So embossing really means raising areas of the paper surface, um, giving the print a more sculptural quality. I have to say this gallery especially is, you know, you get a much better idea of embossing if you're looking at them in person. Um, so the work on the right uh, is a work by Helen Frankenthaler. Um, so the, from 1989, so Frankenthaler began working with Mixografia, uh, which is a studio in Los Angeles on five print editions and one sculpture relief uh, employing their signature printmaking technique. So they've sort of trademarked the technique called the mixografia. And sort of, and what they achieve is these sort of three dimensional prints with sort of with deeply embossed surfaces made completely out of uh, paper and ink. So to sort of create these sort of crater like forms in the composition, Frank um, Fowler uses both subtractive and additive method to create a template in relief. Um, so you can see, so the work, the photograph on the left, um, she's working on another work from that edition called uh, Surocho. Um, and here you see, really see the physicality of making this print. She's gouging, chiseling, she's drilling into this wax lab. Uh, she's also applying acrylic to sort of raise the surface in some areas. And from this wax lab, um, you cast a copper plate that sort of contains these, um, contains the print. And then from that copper plate, you press into, into it with heavy, wet, handmade paper. Um, so Guadalupe is the largest from this series. And I, the way I describe it, it's sort of a imperfectly plastered wall painted with lavender and cool blues and these sort of insides with golden streaks. And if you look really closely in this print to the side, you can sort of see really how thick this paper is. Um, and then the final section we wanted to talk about are, are, are unique prints. Um, so monoprints and monotypes are sort of um, are, are what they're called. And really essentially, they mean um, prints that don't, you know, unique compositions, sort of unique prints, um, either by taking a, so, sorry, I've like, I haven't had, need to explain monoprints and monotypes in a bit. <laughs> um, so a monotype uh, uses sort of a, a flat surface and the artist will paint onto the flat surface 
a design, um, just sort of freehand, and then use, and then press it against paper. And then once you remove the paper, on the paper, you have the design, the very unique design. That's the amount of type. Uh, a monoprint is sort of the same way, except they're using you're using a plate that may have a an initial design, but the placement of color and ink different different differences every single time. Differs every single time. Um, here's an example of a monotype. So Helen Frankenthaler, uh, she did this series of monotypes using um, this sort of block of plywood, essentially, where she would paint on the plywood this design and then press it, press paper against it. And then again, still using the same, the same block of wood, added more color to it, a different design, press another paper against it. So she had a series of prints that were all, or monotypes are all sort of related to one another, um, but she's making changes to it over, after every single press. Um, and yeah, this is another print that um, in this section of the show uh, by Mark Toby. It's an untitled mono print. Um, Toby was um, maybe perhaps one of the lesser known kind of artists in this abstract expressionist generation. He was very influenced by his um, travels in Asia, by Japanese and Chinese callig calligraphy and Eastern philosophy. He was a member of the Baha'i world faith starting in 1918. Um, this was also kind of a great moment for remote collaboration. I asked um, the registrars to go digging for the work file. Um, I was I was kind of flummoxed about what to write about this work because Toby is so known for this white writing technique, which is kind of calligraphic, as you can see. Um, but here it was not quite. It didn't, it didn't feel like white writing because it was this kind of dark colored thing. Um, but what we found was that, you know, he's kind of achieving it in reverse um, by covering the entire plate um, in these kind of dusty rose and um, deep burgundy colors and then selectively scratching it away. So you get this kind of almost macrocosmic, microcosmic, crystalline kind of structure. And really, that's really connected for Toby with his spirituality and his belief in the fundamental interconnectedness of life on earth. Um, and then just to uh, sort of round out the, um, the show, uh, this work by Helen Frankenthaler from 1970 uh, is kind of a unique print kind of not, it's a, it's a technique called pochoir. Um, and pochoir are not typically considered mono um, unique prints, but there, there's a hands-on application of sort of this liquid acry acrylic that sort of makes it unique. Uh, pochoir from the French word for stencil is a technique similar to screen printing. Uh, for this series of prints, Helen Frankenthaler first composed uh, seven different drawings on paper. And then each study was sort of turned into, you know, she was given soft vinyl stencils of the different forms that she, that she designed. Um, and then she applies, she takes the stencil, puts it over the paper, and then hand supplies the color. Um, so when you look, in, and that's really evident in this work uh, called uh, Green Likes Moth, uh, which is one of my favorites of her titles. Another great title. <laughs> <laughs> um, you really capture sort of Frankenthaler's, uh, in, especially uh, in the moth part, uh, these sort of broad sweeps, you really see her hand uh, on this print, which obviously can't be replicated every single time. Um, and she, were, she did this with um, Sheila Marbain of uh, Morel Studios. And uh, Sheila Marbain, uh, has this quote about her experience working with uh, on this series. She says, quote, despite the fact the prints were made as an addition, each print has an original fresh quality, recall, recalling the immediacy of a, of a unique watercolor. Um, so that's kind of our overview, our walkthrough through the show um, and sort of how we got from the very beginning to the end of the show. Um, and we'll definitely take questions now. Um, I do want to mention that 
uh, uh, about Print Austin. Um, so the Print Expo that is occurring in a few weeks, I believe, what is it, February 10th, like that weekend, um, you can go to the Print Expo and check out um, very different kinds of prints. You can buy them, you can talk to the artists, talk to the gallery. Um, it's a really great, uh, you know, events and programs that we have here in Austin that everyone should take advantage of. I'm just gonna put the, uh, the link on the chat for everyone to look. Um, <clears throat> and Jana, if you wanna sort of pick out some questions. Yeah, um, well, we have one question that about how did the Frankenthaler decide to make this wonderful gift to the Blanton? Did the Blanton suggest any works of art and were there any conditions to the gift? So the show was one of the conditions. Um, so here we are. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I, I guess I had assumed that the, that the foundation kind of curated the gift. Is that true? They did. Um, they approached us um, a few years ago uh, with this plan of, they told us that they were going to approach different university museums with sort of a selection of prints, each carefully curated uh, with different kinds of prints. So not the museum, all the museums got, you know, different kinds. And then they also, um, as part of the gift, they also provided us with a grant, a very generous grant to either set up a, organize an exhibition around the gift or a public program around the gift. Uh, just so that, you know, these prints aren't just being stored away to never be seen, you know, so we, we have our paper vault galleries, so it was just a perfect opportunity uh, to have them, you know, they're beautiful, we're showing the entire gift in this show, um, so uh, we're really happy with the Frankenthaler Foundation and everything and their collaboration with us. And I should add, they gave someone, a first time curator, the opportunity to do their first museum, first ever show, which was a museum show and a Frankenthaler show. So thank you to the foundation. <laughs> oh. uh, so I'm looking at another question and whether it's easier to, to dilute acrylic than oil paint. Um, I'm um, probably, I don't think Jan and I are artists, but I have painted both in oil and acrylic. And diluting oil paints uh, requires uh, turpentine, right? Um, to sort of allow it to sort of seep into the canvas. And to dilute acrylic, you just use water. Um, so definitely her shift from oil paints to acrylic probably had a lot to do with uh, probably fewer chemicals, Sort of an easier way to control the dilution and um and she just you know she kind of uh very much preferred that uh going forward after her initial experimentations with um with oil uh another thing that coincidentally about um diluting oil paint is it after years it does leave it does change the canvas in a specific way that I, I believe water and acrylic does not. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see um, Elizabeth Smith from the Helen Frank Dollar Foundation is here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the gift was curated by Ruth Fine, who is an expert on Frank and Dollar prints and the foundation worked closely with her on choosing the museums. So now we know. Thanks for, th thanks for that question and thanks for that answer. Um, all right, we have, we'll take one more, uh, which is the last one from Emily Lee. Uh, is the study for Japanese maple that Frank Feller sent to the printer considered a monotype? And also, could you talk about her interest in translation processes? I wonder why she sent out this monotype to get translated by professional printers when she was comfortable making monotypes straight off plywood elsewhere. So the study isn't the monotype because uh, it was just paint on plywood. There was no, the print was not, there wasn't a paper pressed on top of the study to create the image. So it was really used as a template for professional printmakers 
to create the woodcut. And this is, you know, the collaboration between different printmakers and different printmaking techniques, it's, it's different. You know, she was, she didn't just send out the study for Japanese maple and then came back and saw the different, the study. She, she definitely worked with, with both of them to sort of accurately to pick what she wanted to show and collaborate in that way. Uh, so it really, so it, what, the study isn't, for Japanese people, isn't considered a monotype because it's not on paper. It's definitely just a study. Um, and that way, the printmakers were able to accurately represent what you wanted. I hope that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> Talking in circles for a bit. <laughs> um, well, I think that's it for today's conversation. We made it just in time, uh, one o'clock. Thanks to all, all of you for joining us. Uh, before we go, uh, I have a, a few quick reminders. Uh, we'd like to invite you to our next curated conversation on February 6th, on Wednesday, February 16th at noon. Uh, join blend and curator Veronica Roberts uh, and Los Angeles-based artist Colleen Smith uh, for a discussion about her multimedia practice and work. Currently on view uh, in the museum in a show titled Assembly, New Acquisitions by Contemporary Black Artists. You should definitely uh, tune in for this one. Colleen Smith is an amazing artist and we have such an amazing work from her. Um, so it should be a very interesting program. Uh, for details or to watch past curated conversations, go to blantonmuseum.org slash museum from home. And uh, if you'd like to show your support, uh, become a member today at blantonmuseum.org slash membership. Sign up for our Blanton news at blantonmuseum.org slash subscribe uh, to always be in the know about what's happening at the museum. And finally, if you'd enjoy tonight, today's event, uh, please help us continue to bring quality programming to the community by making a donation at blantonmuseum.org slash pay what you wish. Uh, thanks again, and we hope to see you next month, uh, next month's curated conversation. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you.